Our listeners know how much Laura and I love Afghanistan, but we aren't going to lie or exaggerate. The country has its share of miserable places like any other. Topping our list is Zabul, a province on the highway that connects Kabul and Kandahar. Poverty and illiteracy are stunningly high in Zabul. The main city, Kalat, feels as if its only purpose is to be a stopping point on the highway. Much as it was centuries ago when it served as a fortified rest stop on the road linking Lashkarga and Ghazni, the winter and summer capitals of the Ghaznavid Empire. In 2011, Lori traveled across Zabul from one end to the other, searching for sites to preserve and restore. But sometimes the search disappoints, and ruins can be too ruined to preserve. This is Monuments Woman with Laura Tedesco. I'm your host, George Gavrilis. Today, we're continuing on Laura's journey into Afghanistan. If you're new to this podcast, we recommend going back to start with episode one. For everyone else, welcome back. Let's jump in. In my experience of working with Afghans, and I can't refer to Afghans as monolithic because they're surely not a monolithic population, I always appreciated the way Afghans that I interacted with, both local village elders, when I had the opportunity to meet with them and talk a little bit through an interpreter, or government officials and everyone in between, that there was a very long time horizon in how they would reference Afghan history. And that really was something that stood out to me only because of the focus of what I was there to do. It gave me a really, I think, useful insight. It sort of is a nice segue into what we were going to talk about today, Zabel. But Laurie, wait. Yeah. A listener who doesn't know Afghanistan very well will say she just mispronounced Kabul. Right. Okay, so there's a province called Zabul, not Kabul, Zabul with a Z, and it's to the west and south of the capital province, Kabul. And it's situated on this ring road that we've talked about before, this major historic and contemporary highway that links Kabul to cities in the west. And it's like a big circular road around Afghanistan. And Zabul sits between Ghazni and Kandahar. Strategically, geographically, its location is key. I was invited to go out to Zabul at some point in 2011 to look at a very large building that everyone was calling the Castle of Alexander the Great. And I was like, come on, man, his castles, they're not around anymore. The word on the street that everybody accepted was this building was still Alexander the Great. So they were attributing 2,300 year history to this structure that was standing in the middle of a like mound of the capital city of Zabul, which is Kalat. That's the name of the city. But I was most curious and really appreciated the invitation to go. So I made the trip. Did you ever go to Zabul, George, by chance? (coughs) Sorry. (coughs) Put a pin in that. You really need to stop smoking, George. Uh, Be right there. Don't stop recording. (coughs) Oh, my God. Elizabeth, I'm coming to join you, honey. (laughs) Uh, Did anybody get that reference? I got it. I got it. I'm wearing shorts. You got my Sanford and Son reference? Yes, I did. (laughs) Just light up another cigarette. We'll be good to go. Yeah. Okay. Lori, do you want to re-ask the question? George, I didn't know if you maybe had the pleasure of visiting Zabel yourself one day. Hell no. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you think that given a choice that that's where I would visit? There's Herat, there's Mazari Sharif. I love Mazari Sharif. And you know, I love Kabul more than anything, but I would not be caught dead in Zabul. And that's not just for security reasons. Of all the places to see in Afghanistan, that is not on my bucket list. (laughs) And it's not because somebody misspelled Kabul. (laughs) You don't know what you're missing. I'm sure it's amazing, but for some context, it is poor as poor can be. Yeah, it is staggeringly poor. Even by Afghan standards, it's a very poor place. I looked up a couple things because admittedly, that's one province that I know very little about. And I was surprised. Because it's a relatively large province, 
And yet it only has 400,000 people. Mm -hmm. And Kalat, the provincial capital that you mentioned, only has a population around 50,000, mm -hmm. at least on a permanent basis. We don't know what the refugee situation is like now as the Taliban has taken over so many areas around it. Right, right. I didn't realize the population was that small, but when I was there, it seemed very sparsely populated. Right. And I also looked up some UN reports. It's one of the poorest places in Afghanistan and, and in a country that otherwise made so many strides in girls' education. That too is a laggard province where only 28% of the girls last time I checked a report were in school. Yeah. When I was there, I remember hearing that literacy rates for women were less than 1%. That's probably right. And I, I remember being really struck, really, really struck by that, less than 1%. Besides Alexander's alleged castle, what did you see? A lot for the four or so days that I spent there. I was invited out by the commanding officer of the PRT slash FOB, who was this Air Force lieutenant colonel, a really great guy who I had gotten to know through various meetings in Kabul over the course of months and sort of talking and meeting with him or exchanging emails. He had said, why don't you come out to Zabul and check out this castle of Alexander the Great? And I was a little bit skeptical that, in fact, it was Alexander's castle. The remnants of Alexander may have been buried under the ground, but highly doubtful that anything Alexander or his armies built would still be visible above ground. There's just too much time that's passed. But I said, you know, if I come out, do you think we could drive across Zabul? Because I'm really interested to see these alleged or reported towers that are supposed to be along the ring road. I've seen some old grainy photographs from decades ago, but could we go look for those? Because I think those might be really interesting. So he did allow that to happen. I remember one day spending about 10 or 11 hours stuffed in the back of a small MRAP driving from one end of Zabul to the other, almost to the border of Kandahar, and then back. Entirely on the ring road? Yeah. I was stuffed in this MRAP with two or three other American soldiers in the back. And they're like, okay, we're going to do this, but we got to make some stops along the way to monitor projects that they, the U.S. military, were somehow involved in. So we stopped along this road, and, and I was craning my neck and peering out this little tiny six inch by nine inch foggy window on the side of an MRAP looking for towers along the archaeological sites. And in fact, we did find one and we did stop. And it was a very exciting day to see these half broken shot up towers that had been chopped in half and half the side had been blown off or shot to bits. We stopped at a Romanian FOB, you know, a forward operating base where the Romanian soldiers were placed. I didn't know there were Romanian soldiers in Afghanistan. And they were having a change of command that day where one commander was leaving and a new one was coming in. So there's a whole ceremony to mark that. And I got to sit through this ceremony, which was really interesting. And I ate some lunch with the Romanians. So you asked, what did I see in Zabul? I was really there to do an assessment. Could we start a preservation project, bring attention to a monument in Zabul, this very poor, again, dusty beige place, not quite on you know the top 10 list of destinations in Afghanistan, evidently not on your bucket list, George. This was one of the realizations I had while making this epic road trip across Zabul, Every few miles, I noticed that the road, which was paved, had enormous potholes. And it took me a while to figure out what those were. And I asked the soldiers I was riding with, those are the results of explosions, aren't they? And they were like, yeah, that's why the road's messed up. And this was in spring of 2011 when Zabul was considered a pretty stable province. And it was a realization of this is going to be tough. 
to try to embark on a hands-on restoration project of a monument in Zabel, and particularly one of these towers. I think they might have been kind of markers along a road. And I really was only able to stop and get up close and personal with one of them. What was left was only about 12, 14 feet tall. And half of it on the side, so if you were to take a cheese slicer and slice down half of it, that was all exposed with jagged brickwork. It looked like a rocket launcher had blasted half of it off. The destruction on it did not look just the result of sort of natural neglect and erosion. It didn't appear that way at all. It appeared more kind of that that structure experienced something dramatic. And it was thrilling to see. I will say, even in its state of disrepair and degradation, it was thrilling to see. And we genuinely really thought through, what can we do here? And the U.S. military help provide protection if we were to send out a team or who would work here? We'll figure out where to get the bricks later. But first, let's just try to think about some big picture solutions. And the conclusion was, I don't think we can do this. When you're there and you're looking at it and you're doing something that's ultimately on the spot forensic analysis. What are archaeological practices like? What do archaeological regulations or mores tell you? Are you able to remove a couple pieces and take them back to the museum for analysis? What are you able to do and what are you not able to do with artifacts that you find on the ground in an unsecure location? There are international standards and charters, like a body of rules in the international heritage preservation world that, in principle, practitioners are to follow, are to adhere to. In this case, we're not talking about artifacts on the ground. I wasn't doing an archaeological survey where I was walking around looking for artifacts that might have surfaced over the course of sort of rain seasons or whatever. I was looking at standing monuments in general and this particular standing monument in Zabel. And when we made the stop on the side of the road, like three MRAPs pull over, It's like a rest stop. You get out. You don't have a lot of time to be milling around. We weren't setting up for a picnic. We had a job to do. So I go over to this tower. I'm going to call it a tower. And I'm like, all right, I got to quickly make a visual assessment here. Take pictures, make some notes. What does the brickwork look like? What's its condition? I was with the soldiers who I remember one was genuinely curious about it, but I couldn't really consult with him on what do you think? Does this look like Gosnavud bricks? What are their dimensions? Are they square or are they rectangular? I didn't have the luxury of being able to be there to really talk through my questions that were in my mind. So could I have collected things and brought them back to the museum for analysis? No, I could not. There was no analysis to do at the museum. There's not an analysis laboratory there. It just wouldn't have been the proper practice. So I didn't touch anything. I just observed, took notes, and took pictures, and tried to use that information to inform a bigger decision. I'm one gal, and I could only take on so many projects. Well, say a little bit about that, because you must have been asked so many times to take on a project in this place, in that place, this province, that district. How often would you find yourself saying no? about 40% of the time. I wasn't saying no because I wanted to say no. It was, I was overwhelmed with the quantity of work and the population of American diplomats in the provinces as it became known that there was this archaeology gal at the U.S. Embassy who was working on cultural preservation, the PRTs in the provinces were like, oh man, you should come out and check out our sites in Paktika or Gore or Kandahar. Can you get out to Kandahar? There's some great mausoleums. And I simply couldn't do it all. I was already overwhelmed with the number of projects that were in the pipeline and active in places like Herat and in the north and in Ghazni. And then there was Messinok in nearby Logar province, which was quite time-consuming 
as well. So as a one woman gal, I had great support at the US embassy, but I didn't have a team of people who were working with me and helping me with the paperwork and all the other details. So I had to be mindful of just not taking on more than I could handle. Well, take me to the provincial capital, Kala. We're talking about Alexander the Great's castle. It was more like a garrison. It was a Balahisar, for all intents and purposes. Most capital cities have one from some point in antiquity. And that's what this was in Kalat. It was a big mound in the center of what was otherwise a pretty flat, dusty place. We drove all of a couple of kilometers from the PRT where I was staying to Alexander's Castle and walk up the side of it. And I see some standing architecture and I'm like, this isn't really a castle. This looks more like a barracks of antiquity. And I don't think this is Alexander's. And everyone was like, no, no, he was here. And I'm like, he might have been there, but his architecture is not still visible. What we really need to do is to do some archaeology. Like we need to dig in here, spend some time, bring a team of archaeologists out and look at what's under the ground. And then we can tell the real story of Alexander's alleged presence and residence here. Well, as far as we can tell, he went from Iran down into Kandahar and up towards what is today Kabul through this area. So it makes sense that in 331 or so BC, he was marching through this area. Yes. Yeah. To my knowledge, no one's ever conducted an archaeological investigation to verify exactly where was Alexander and his armies building their garrison. And that's almost irrelevant, George. The best nugget in this whole story is that not just people of Zabul and the commanding officer who very kindly invited me out to look at this, everyone attributed it to Alexander the Great. So they were by association giving this grandeur and importance to Zabul that once upon a time, it was awesome, so awesome, that Alexander hung around long enough to build a massive garrison. And that adherence to the lore, I encountered that in Afghanistan so much. And I loved it because it gave me an insight Afghans love their history. They sure do. And that's the irony, right? That the world thinks that Afghans are so faithful and so deeply religious that they would dislike anything that is not immediately Islamic. And that is just not the case. Absolutely. Even though we know, as we said, that shit ain't Alexander the Great. It is not. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to the top of the castle and visit the glass tea house? I did. I did. The windows were cracked and broken and no one was serving tea at that time. I would have liked to sit and have a cup of tea. It was not possible. Describe the landscape when you're up there. What does the town of Kalat and the surrounding countryside look like? All right. It's very flat. It's very beige. All of the buildings are low mud brick buildings from a high place. And you kind of look across, you can see on the roofs of some of the buildings, people might be drying fruits or carpets. It didn't go as far as the eye could see, George. And when you squint, it did not look like Los Angeles. I'll tell you that. Pretty small and pretty desolate. So on one of these trips, you stayed for four days, which meant you would be spending the night there. Where were you spending the night? What were dinners like? So I was assigned a room. I had my own room. There was a bed. That's all I needed. I'm sure there was a shower. It was fine. It met my needs perfectly. I remember I ate most of Was my- this at the PRT or at the Four Seasons Collot? Yeah. No, the Four Seasons was being renovated. And so I was staying at the PRT that visit. I remember I ate most of my meals alone, which was also fine. I would just go to the little cafeteria and get a tray of whatever was being served. 
which also did the trick. I remember one night I was there and I was chatting with the American diplomats who were at the PRT and they offered a Coke or something to me. They're like, yeah, they're right over there in the fridge. So I went over to the fridge and I saw there was a non-alcoholic beer and I was like, oh man, I'd really like that non-alcoholic beer. And so I asked them, guys, could I have this? And they're like, yeah, sure, take it. And like seven years later, I ran into one of those diplomats and he was very nice to me even seven years later. And he's like, I remember you drank that non-alcoholic beer. And I was like, I spent four days with you and your only memory was that I drank a non-alcoholic beer. Like, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, Lori and her near beer. Right, right. You had some pretty illustrious company for one or two of the dinners, right? The governor was around. Oh, yeah. The governor of Zabul. He was, and I believe his name was Nazari, if I'm not mistaken, the governor at that time. And I was invited to a dinner at his residence with the commanding officer, the American Air Force Lieutenant Colonel that I mentioned. Most of the dinner was the governor and the American officer talking their business we spent a few minutes talking about Zabel's heritage, of which at that time I knew very little. I was still wrapping my head around it. And I remember while we were at that dinner, the colonel received a call because he was not present at the FOB. He had to carry a radio with him at all times. And he received a call that there was a car at the gate of the PRT slash FOB. And the car had children in it who were seriously wounded. Maybe they encountered a landmine, an unexploded landmine, and it, the kids played with it, you know, inadvertently, and then were gravely injured. And this family had put the kids in the car and brought them to the PRT for medical attention. Evidently, that was the place to get the best medical care. Of course, yeah. And I watched the commander have to make it very difficult decision whether to let the car in for medical treatment for the kids or to turn the car away. And why he was faced with this life and death decision is because some months earlier, a car had come to a fob claiming to have injured children in it, and the car was allowed to enter. And there were no injured children in the car. It was laden with explosives. And so this commander, this colonel, had to very quickly make a very difficult decision whether to take the risk. And we knew what decision he was facing because we were all sitting together in this small room and he was speaking quietly and, you know, without drama, but it was evident the gravity of what he was facing. And he decided to let the car come in and the kids were treated, ultimately. I wonder if we should catch up with him. I'd like to. Find out what he's doing today. I'd like to. I've lost touch with him, but I could maybe find him. What's his name? Colonel Veras. Andy Veras. Very fine person. At the time that you would have been there, I remember that there were high hopes for Zabul province, that it could become a showcase for how the Afghan government but especially the Afghan army could establish good bonds with local communities, protect local communities, even resolve local disputes in some cases. And I remember that at the time, the ANSF, the Afghan National Security Forces, were relatively trusted at a time when the government wasn't, mm. when the police forces certainly weren't in this particular district, at least on the villages right off the ring road, mm. the main population centers in Zabul. And there would have been a lot of reporters looking into this. Yeah. I made ultimately several trips to Zabul, but this first one that lasted four days. I happened to be there at the same time as a New York Times reporter who was doing a story on Zabul. She was a really well-known reporter. She had really a great reputation for doing excellent reporting, and she had a deep knowledge of Afghanistan. So I was pretty intimidated and she wasn't there to have anything to do with why I was there. It was a coincidence that we happened to be there at the same time. And I remember sitting around that first evening 
with her and with the commanding officer. And they were talking and I was present to get some time with Colonel Verez also. And he made a reference to our trip. I think it was the next day when we were going to go see Alexander's castle. And I made the remark out loud that she heard where I said, I don't think that's going to be Alexander's. I don't think his architecture is still well preserved above the ground, but let's go have a look. I'm really interested and, you know, quite excited to go see this. And I remember her response to me was like, what the hell do you know? I remember feeling quite put in my place quickly by this journalist. Lori, isn't it nice when women in a male dominated <laughs> space support each other? It feels so good. Isn't it lovely? I do love that. <laughs> anyway, I remember feeling kind of like, oh, wow, ouch, ouchy. I, I'm not going to really say anything else anymore to her. And it so happened that at the end of this particular trip, she and I were put on the same helicopter to leave Zabel, and we were the only two people on the helicopter, and that we sat on the two seats furthest from each other. She wanted nothing to do with me, and I was not particularly interested in becoming Facebook friends with her. And we leave Zabel with our final destination being Kabul, the capital. And we had to make a stop in Ghazni, which was on the way. So we go all of like 15 minutes in the air, up from Zabel, plop down in the PRT in Ghazni, and a bunch of other passengers get on. And I happen to know one of the passengers getting on who happened to know I was going to be on that helicopter. And I was gifted an iced cappuccino by this other passenger. And I was like, oh man, this is going to be the best iced cappuccino ever. I've not had one of these in a long time. And I'm sucking down this iced cappuccino. And I remember the journalist kind of looking at me like, you bitch. Like, how'd you get that? <laughs> you bougie, you bougie diplomat. You know, kind of like that. I might be reading into it. She might not have been thinking that, but it felt, it didn't help my standing with her that I was drinking an iced cappuccino on a helicopter ride from Ghazni. She wrote a very nice piece in the New York Times at that time about Zabel and Colonel Verez, and that came out shortly after that time we were together. P.S. There's no... Four Seasons in Kalat. <laughs> I just wanted to make that clear to the listeners in case they didn't catch your awesome, <laughs> awesome irony. <laughs> You've been listening to Monuments Woman with Laura Tedesco. I'm your host, George Gavrilis. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. To stay in touch, also follow us on Instagram at The Monuments Woman. Join us next week when we dive deeper. This show is produced by Christian D. Brun and May 11 Project. It is recorded by Audovita Studios and edited by Sean Hedinger and Greg Williams. The theme song is This Love by Ariana Delawari, featuring Salar Nader. This is-